Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's Medical Grand Rounds. I will go ahead and get us started with some reminders and introductions. First off, next week we will be hearing from Dr. Dan Sager, a practicing rheumatologist with Providence Hood River, who will be giving the talk, Diagnostic Disorientation, a Redirection. And just a few logistics, we are here on the Teams Live platform, a shared grand rounds between Providence St. Vincent and Providence Portland Medical Centers. And you can earn CME credit by watching here with us live virtual, or by watching a recording of the event. And that recording is available at the same link as the Grand Rounds invite. I'll be monitoring the Q&A throughout the session today. So please go ahead and post any comments or any questions that you have. And I will mostly save those until the end as time permits. And now I'm very excited to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Brad Spellberg. Dr. Spellberg is the Chief Medical Officer at the Los Angeles County University of Southern California Medical Center, where he maintains extensive administrative, patient care, and teaching activities. Dr. Spellberg staffs the internal medicine work teams, infectious disease consulting service, and the antibiotic stewardship service at LA County, one of the largest public hospitals in the United States. He also maintains an active NIH-funded basic science laboratory that focuses on novel solutions to combating antibiotic-resistant infections. At the national level, Dr. Spellberg has worked extensively to bring attention to the problems of increasing drug resistance and the lack of new antibiotics, and is now working to raise attention to the need for national health care reform. He's testified before Congress and participated in numerous national meetings on antibiotic-resistant bugs and how to combat them. In 2009, he published the book, Rising Plague, to inform and educate the public about the crisis in antibiotic-resistant infections and lack of antibiotic development. And his latest book, Broken, Bankrupt, and Dying, How to Solve the Great American Healthcare Ripoff, was published in June of 2020. Dr. Spellberg, so excited to have you with us. I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much and appreciate the invite very much. Um, I was saying just before we went live here that the origins of this talk actually are with the Oregon ID Society when Dave Gilbert a few years back asked me to talk about oral therapy. That was the first time I'd ever given the talk that evolved into the demented madness that you're about to hear for the next 50 minutes or so. So <clears throat> what we're going to do today is ask the following question. Is it reasonable to consider oral antibiotic therapy for three diseases that historically the medical community has said, that's the third rail, don't go there. It's gotta be IV only. You're insane if you even mention the word oral in the same sentence as osteomyelitis, bacteremia, or endocarditis. So we're asking the question, is it reasonable to consider oral therapy for these three diseases. Now I'm going to take you through a bunch of data, but before we do that, we're going to spend the first seven, eight minutes talking about a philosophical framework for how to think through the answer to this question. There is a pro argument. There is a con argument. Now, I am not known for my subtlety. It turns out I am autosomal recessive, total 100% defect in subtlety genes. So we will see if you can discern from my tone of voice which side of this debate I am on. <clears throat> there are three points that underline the pro argument that it is reasonable to consider oral therapy for these diseases. First, in contrast to historical old antibiotics, and we'll actually show you some of the data. Modern oral antibiotics actually do achieve adequate levels in blood and bone to inhibit the growth of target microbes. Um, phrased another way, the bacteria don't actually know the route of administration you use to deliver the antibiotic. They just know if enough drug gets to where they are to inhibit their growth. It's not like they're the bacteria like sitting in bone going, well, normally, if this much antibiotic is around, I would stop growing, but you chose to give it orally, so I simply refuse to stop growing. 
They're smart, but they're not that smart. Second, we know from numerous studies, including prospective studies, including randomized control trials, that long-term IV therapy is intrinsically less safe. We tend to underestimate the harm that occurs to people when you put a large plastic tube in their central veins for six weeks at a time. It turns out hominids did not evolve to have large plastic tubing in their central veins for six weeks at a time. The rates of pretty substantial adverse events range between 10 and up to 50%, depending on the study you look at. And these are things like deep vein thrombosis, central line infections, fractured lines, line migration, which may require surgery or IR intervention to retrieve, bleeding at the line site, the line stops working, you need to replace a new line, all kinds of these complications, we underestimate the frequency with which these occur. And finally, third, I will show you the extensive randomized controlled trial data that showed that oral <laughs> antimicrobial therapy works for these three diseases and that there are no randomized control trials showing that IV is superior. That is quite surprising to people who just presume that we know from the past that IV is more effective, but we don't because there are no such studies that have ever been done. That's a pretty compelling set of pro arguments, but there are obviously con arguments and here's how the two principal con arguments go. Quite reliably, I might add, having debated this innumerable times with people over the last several years. First, any data you show me suggesting that oral therapy may work are imperfect and not reliable to extrapolate to my patient. And if you cannot show me perfect data with no flaws that extrapolate to all patients in all scenarios at all times, then we have to keep doing what we've always done. Now again, autosomal recessive for the subtlety genes, obviously you can tell which side of the debate I'm on. Here's the problem with this con argument, that if you can't give me perfect data that extrapolate to all patients in all scenarios, historical practice must continue. Here's the problem. Let me introduce you to Dr. Benjamin Rush, and I will say at the beginning here, I am not introducing you to Dr. Rush to bash Dr. Rush, to make fun of Dr. Rush, to demean Dr. Rush. I have great respect for Dr. Rush. The point of this story is that no matter how smart you are, no matter how eminent you are, no matter how truly talented you are, if you don't have high quality data, I don't care how strong your opinion is, sometimes you could be wrong. So with that as an introduction, Dr. Rush was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. This was a major dude. He was the Surgeon General of the Continental Army under Washington. Aside from being a very prominent physician, he actually believed in scientific experimentation. He believed in empiricism. He believed that people should conduct studies to learn about the world around them, and he was considered in the colonial era, a leader of the American scientific enlightenment. He was certainly by far the most prominent physician in the United States during the colonial and post-colonial eras. There's a reason there's a medical school named after him. He also believed in bloodletting and probably killed some people during a malaria outbreak in the DC area. But more importantly, for our purposes today, he was the inventor of something called Russia's thunderbolts. Now, it's very important that you understand that I'm not making this up because you're going to think to yourself, there's no way this is real. You've totally made this up. But you can actually, while you're watching, go on to Google right now. You can ask Dr. Google about Russia's thunderbolts, and Dr. Google will tell you I am not making this up about Russia's thunderbolts. Now, what were Russia's thunderbolts? They were a purgative cure all that Dr. Rush invented and patented, um, which were used to treat any ailment that you had, and they worked by inducing voluminous diarrhea to expunge the evil humors from your body. So if you had a fever, well, you needed some Rush's thunderbolts. Well, you have a headache and some abdominal pain, 
I think you need some Russia's Thunderbolts. Oh, you fell and broke your arm. Well, what you really need is some Russia's Thunderbolts. They were used for everything. And in fact, and again, this is true, I'm not making this up, Lewis and Clark purchased several hundred doses of Russia's Thunderbolts to take on their journey with them. And in their journals, they actually documented repeatedly administering Russia's Thunderbolts to their colleagues who were suffering from a variety of ailments as they trekked across the length of the United States and back. What were the ingredients of Russia's patented Thunderbolt cure-all? Well, there were two principal ingredients. The first was an extract of the jalap plant, which was the principal thing that made you have some diarrhea. And the second was mercury. Wah, wah, wah. Now, here's where things become really sad. Doctors in the United States continue to overtly poison and harm people with Russia's Thunderbolt cure-all for more than 150 years because Dr. Rush told them to. This is a pharmacy compounding manual published in 1946 describing how to mix together jalap extract with mercury into essentially what was a Russia's Thunderbolt. This is in the penicillin era, people. Okay, here's the point. Historical practice based on no data does not require perfect data that extrapolate to all scenarios to overturn. Any reasonable data is sufficient to overturn mythological practice based on no data. Phrased differently, evidence-based medicine is preferred to eminence-based medicine, or as my mentor taught me, he was chair of medicine when I was a med student and resident. Data beat no data, and better data beat worse data. Now, I will point out the original statements that I heard uttered were data trump no data and better data trump worse data, but Dr. Brass has insisted that I changed the phrasing of these sayings. You wanna talk about another luminary of medicine. Osler himself said 50% of everything I'm teaching you is wrong. The only problem is I don't know which 50%. He understood that he didn't have all the answers. He was doing the best he could with imperfect information. And some of the stuff he was teaching was wrong and he was hoping that his students as they evolved as clinicians over time would evolve their practice as new information became available. Now, there's gonna be a point in this talk where people are gonna be thinking, maybe not you, but your neighbor, someone in the audience is gonna be thinking, all right, all right, all right, all right. You're, you're starting to convince me that we have some data that you know oral therapy can work for these diseases, but you know, all these trials, there is this concern about them or that concern about them. So I just, I'm not comfortable doing it. If you're gonna complain that the 21 randomized control trials I'm gonna show you are flawed, I'm gonna have to presume that you're aware of some randomized control trials that I'm not aware of that show the contrary conclusion. Because if you aren't, if you don't have those contrary data, then my people have a word for that. And the word is chutzpah because it takes some serious chutzpah to criticize 21 concordant randomized control trials because they have some flaws when you have not a single one that draws the opposite conclusion. With that as a background, let us proceed. And let's start with osteomyelitis. Now, I like to start my osteomyelitis discussions you're starting to get a sense of the dementia that underlies the length of this talk. So to continue that theme, I like to start my osteomyelitis talk by asking the following question. What is the oldest known case of osteomyelitis? How far back in time must we go to discover the oldest known case of osteomyelitis? Now, um, people sometimes say mummies, Probably some Egyptian mummies got some POTS disease somewhere, right? You have to go back a skosh further in time than that to this fella right here. It turns out that there was a Demetrodon 
somewhere around 250, 260 million years ago that suffered from osteomyelitis. And that was discovered some time later by a pathologist who A, clearly had way too much time on his hands, and B, clearly was not working in an RVU environment because he decided to investigate a fractured shaft with a callus in the spinal processes of one of these poor dimetrodons, sectioned the callus, and histopathologically diagnosed osteomyelitis. Now, this is where things become interesting because the 250 million year old case of osteomyelitis actually highlights some of the modern challenges of dealing with this disease. For example, the case went undiagnosed until rather late in the course when someone finally got a bone biopsy. The person who got the bone biopsy didn't send it for culture to help us target therapy, right? How often does that happen in the modern era? And any treatment that was administered probably was given late, didn't probably didn't work very well, although I will point out if there was treatment administered at the time, it probably was administered orally. Between the case of the dimetrodon of osteomyelitis 250 million years ago and the modern era, not very much changed in osteomyelitis management. For most of that 250 million years, we were kind of static in our approach to this disease until this paper was published in 1970. If you want to know why every clinician in our solar system, I mean, because I've surveyed planet Neptune and they do it there too, give six weeks of IV antibiotics for osteomyelitis? The answer is because of this quote right here in this paper right here. This actually is gonna set a precedent that's gonna come up again in this talk. It turns out, if you want to establish an urban legend in which everyone believes and no one knows why, but they believe fervently for half a century or more, all you need to do is publish an opinion in the New England Journal of Medicine. That seems to be the key to this phenomenon. So Dr. Waldvogel told us that you have to give four to six weeks of IV antibiotics to treat osteo. And everyone said, oh, okay, we have to give four to six weeks of IV antibiotics to treat osteo. Probably not so much realizing that this statement was buried in the discussion of an uncontrolled retrospective case series from the 1950s and 60s where they didn't even try oral therapy. And what they used was IV penicillin and aminoglycosides. This is the data, people. When I show you the randomized control trials and you tell me they have, they have flaws, you're coming back at me with this. So yeah, remember what I said about chutzpah? Okay. About a decade ago, Ben Lipsky and I were pretty frustrated with the state of osteomyelitis literature. So we decided to do a systematic review. And one of the questions we asked was data around oral therapy. Let's start from first principles. Go back to the bacteria. You don't know how, what route you use to give the drug. Can you get antibiotic into bone at levels that exceed target MICs? And the answer is with modern antibiotics like the fluoroquinolones, metronidazole, linezolid, bactrim, clinda, rifampin, there are others as well. Yeah, you can. You can get levels into bone after oral dosing that are far in excess of the target MICs of these pathogens. So just based on pharmacological principles, you would hypothesize we have oral agents today that can treat gram-negative, anaerobic, and gram-positive osteomyelitis. Are there clinical data that validate that hypothesis based on pharmacology? And the answer is yes. There are now more than 40 observational studies showing that oral therapy for osteo results in similar cure rates as has been seen historically with IV therapy for this disease. And I am not aware of any observational studies that have shown very high failure rates of oral therapy for osteomyelitis. Now, of course, these are observational studies. They're prone to bias. Do we have high quality randomized control trials? And the answer is, uh, yeah, we have nine of them. How many do you need? How many randomized control trials do you do? And then at that point, you just start piling on. Where's the number enough to start to change practice? We have nine randomized control trials that have compared 
oral transitional therapy to IV only therapy, or in one of the cases, it was six weeks IV and then six weeks oral. The others were entirely IV only. That's nine trials. And they all showed that oral therapy was as effective as IV. And we have a grand total of none that have drawn the opposite conclusion. Now, I don't have time to walk you through all nine trials. This trial is my favorite trial in the history of trials. And the reason is because Dr. Yuba and colleagues, it's not a large trial, but they randomized people to IV beta lactam or oral bactam or fampin. But the reason it's my favorite trial is because they followed patients for a median of 10 years before they published the results of the study. Just imagine the crippling degree of OCD that it would take to conduct a randomized control trial, randomize patients, and then follow them for a decade before you felt confident enough to pull the data together and publish it. Dr. Yuba and his colleagues have given me hope that perhaps I too someday may overcome my crippling OCD and become a productive member of society. And that's why I love this trial so much. Of course, what they found was no difference in outcome, including cure or relapse, including in patients with retained foreign bodies. Now that was the um, seventh randomized control trial Dr. Yuba did, the seventh randomized. The eighth randomized control trial was the OVIVA study, which everybody said when it first got published, oh, we finally have a randomized control trial of oral versus IV therapy for osteo. And I was like, you mean we finally have the eighth randomized? Because it was the eighth, right? Now it was very important. I don't want to undersell the importance here. It was by far the largest study ever conducted. But it was the eighth study. And there's been a ninth published since OVIVA as well. They studied osteomyelitis caused by a variety of pathogens, and across all analyses that they looked at, primary and all the prioritized secondary analyses, there was no difference in outcome between oral and IV. Frankly, for most of the analyses, the point estimate favored, if anything, oral. IV didn't look better, it kind of is a little worse. So skeptical was the New England Journal of Medicine, which after all had created the myth of IV only therapy a half century earlier, that they forced the authors to do a worst case sensitivity analysis where they set all missing data in the oral arm to failure and all missing data in the IV arm to success. And even in that worst case analysis, there was no statistical difference between oral and IV therapy crossing the zero line here, okay? But you know what was different? between oral and IV therapy, the rate of harm from the IV, which was ninefold higher in patients getting IV only therapy than oral transitional therapy. And my commentary to this is, duh. You know what else was different? They prospectively surveyed patients with a validated survey for all patients randomized. And patients that were randomized to oral therapy reported significantly better mobility, self-care activity, pain, discomfort, anxiety, and depression. It turns out patients don't like having large plastic tubing in their central veins for six weeks at a time. And again, my comment is, duh. And of course, oral therapy was less expensive. Now, last year, some colleagues got together and decided to do a systematic review and meta-analysis. So for the osteo data, here is your tabular summary of the nine randomized control trials. Here is your success rate with oral therapy and your success rate with IV therapy. Here is your weighted average oral versus weighted average IV. That's more than 1,300 patients being randomized now. If you prefer more formal forest plot meta-analysis, here is your random effects forest plot meta-analysis with your summary statistic showing no statistical difference between oral and IV therapy for this disease, and your funnel plot showing no evidence of publication bias. Now, those nine trials, as remember, compared to oral transitional to IV only therapy. In addition to those nine trials, there are 18 other randomized control trials one of them is a quasi-experimental study. So it's really 17 RCTs and a quasi-experimental study, nine in adults, nine in children. 
in which oral therapy predominantly was, was compared in both arms. 90% of the therapy in both arms was oral. These studies compared either different antimicrobial regimens or a different duration of therapy, predominantly oral in both arms. And in all of these studies, the cure rates were in the 80 to 85% rate, which is exactly what you have seen from all the historical literature, whether it's oral or IV in other trials. These other 18 trials compared every conceivable iteration of osteomyelitis, vertebral osteo, diabetic foot osteo, prosthetic joint osteo, with a variety of antimicrobial regimens. Amoxiclab was by far the most common regimen studied for diabetic feet, quinolones with or without rifampin, Bactrim, Linezolid, Clinda, it's all in there. This collectively is an incredibly robust data set demonstrating that oral therapy works just fine for this disease. So let's switch gears quickly and talk about bacteremia and endocarditis. I told you why everybody thinks you have to use IV therapy for osteo because Dr. Wald Vogel said so in 1970. If you want to know why everybody thinks you need IV therapy for endocarditis, it all stems originally from this case series right here, published in 1943. Before penicillin came along, sulfonilamide was actually the real beginning of the antimicrobial revolution. It hit the market in the United States in late 1936, and people began in desperation to use it for a variety of infections, and it worked for most of them. It, they also tried it for bacterial endocarditis. And so in 1943, Dr. Lichtman published a retrospective review of 2,500 patients treated from the pre-sulfa era and 764 patients treated with sulfa since the availability of sulfonilamide. And what he found was that before sulfa, endocarditis was almost uniformly fatal. The mortality rate was greater than 99%. Sulfonamides actually did improve that to 4%, which is like better than less than 1%, but still you could sort of mathematically express the result of this study as 400% of a not good outcome is 400% of a not good outcome. Not very good, right? There were other case series that found similar outcomes with sulfonilamide. When erythromycin and tetracycline came along in the late 1940s and early 1950s, they were also attempted for endocarditis and they did better. They got you to 20-ish percent cure rates with endocarditis, but it was nowhere near what IV penicillin was achieving in the 75 to 85% success rate. These were the data sets available, non-controlled case series and retrospective studies of sulfonilamide, erythro, and tetracycline when a luminary of medicine, Dr. Max Finland, really the godfather of infectious diseases in the United States, published this opinion piece in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1954, in which he wrote, Oral may sometimes work, but it probably doesn't work and causes a lot of failures, although it's not very well studied, so we don't really know. Here's the quote, people. If you want to know why everyone in the United States thinks you need to give IV-only therapy for endocarditis, it's because of this quote by this eminent author in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1954. That's the data. When I show you the randomized controlled trials and you don't like them, this is what you're coming back at me with. If he had only waited two years, that's the tragedy. In 1956, oral penicillin finally became available. People started to use it. The first case series, small, four patients with endocarditis, three were cured with oral penicillin. The only person who failed had staph aureus that was actually resistant to penicillin in vitro. <laughs> so, <clears throat> A couple years ago now, some colleagues got together, decided to do the same review article as we had previously done for osteo, but this time for endocarditis. Pharmacologically, tetracycline and erythromycin, these are not bloodstream drugs. They have enormous volumes of distribution. You administer them, they go into the blood and they immediately leave the blood and go into the parenchymal tissues and are concentrated intracellularly. 
peak levels in blood are very low and not in excess of the target MICs of relevant pathogens. Why would you even think to use these drugs for a high-grade bloodstream infection? Sulfonilamide's blood levels are better, but its antimicrobial activity is much worse. The MICs are much higher, so you still cannot reliably get above the target MICs with sulfonilamide in blood. These three old historical drugs on which Dr. Finland based his opinion are drugs none of us would ever think to use for endocarditis in 2022. But more modern antimicrobials actually do achieve levels in blood well in excess of the target MICs of pathogens. So, sort of hypothesizing based on pharmacology, we should have oral options. Are there clinical data that validate the hypothesis? For bacteremia, there are now 10 published randomized controlled trials. I will point out the 11th trial, the Sabato trial, was presented at ECMID last year. It is not yet published, but in presentation in abstract form, it found exactly the same thing. So soon we will have 11 randomized controlled trials, seven for bacteremia, soon to be eight, so, so seven for gram-positive bacteremia, soon to be eight, and three for gram-negative bacteremia. And in every single one of these studies, oral therapy was at least as effective as IV-only therapy. In a couple of the studies, oral therapy was clinically superior on cure and death. In none of the studies was IV superior. Here are your 10 currently published studies. Oral success rates, IV success rates, summaries, uh, weighted average success oral versus IV. And here is your forest plot meta-analysis. Look at how the data skew. You've got a couple of studies statistically better oral, but even the ones that aren't statistically better sir, trend that way. The summary statistic barely crosses zero in favor of oral. Not only does IV not look worse, I'm sorry, not only does oral not look worse, it kind of looks maybe a little better. Not what you would have expected when you actually started looking at the data. Yeah, but that's bacteremia. Anybody can treat bacteria. What about endocarditis? That's like real bacteremia, right? In addition to the PK, there are 15 published observational studies of oral therapy with a wide diversity of patients, mostly left-sided disease, including prosthetic valves, many different organisms, including MRSA. All of them kind of showed oral therapy worked okay in these studies. None of them had scary outcomes. In addition to those 15 studies, there are two case control studies I'll quickly mention. The first case control study, 66 patients treated in France, mostly left-sided disease with devices. There definitely was staph aureus in there. 19 of these 66 patients were switched to oral therapy. They were not switched to oral therapy because they were doing well. They were switched to oral therapy because they were not doing well. They had developed complications or side effects from the IV or the IV therapy. 12 of those 19 had left-sided endocarditis. And those patients had a variety of organisms, mostly staph. They were given a variety of antimicrobial regimens and none of them died, which was looking pretty good relative to the success rate of the IV treated patients. In the second larger case control study, now 400 cases, mostly left-sided, lots of devices, lots of staph, a variety of oral therapies studied, there was a statistically significant lower death rate in patients who were switched to oral than IV, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, right? Because everyone's like, oh, IV's better. Okay, case control study, retrospective, subject to bias and all that, but kind of looked like oral did okay here. In addition, 15 observational two case control. We have three randomized control trials, I'm gonna show you all three, and a quasi-experimental study, and I'm gonna show you that one too. The first randomized control trial ever published for IV oral therapy for endocarditis was in 1991. This was entirely streptococcal endocarditis, so no staph. It was either Viridans or Bova strep, and all 30 patients were cured, including the 15 who got transitioned to oral therapy. The second randomized control trial was all staph, no strep, entirely staph. This was from Johns Hopkins. 
And it was in patients with injection drug use history who had suspected right-sided endocarditis. Now, the important thing or unimportant thing about this study is that patients were randomized to oral versus IV in the emergency room based on suspicion before confirmation. And subsequently, if you were not confirmed to have endocarditis, you were simply dropped from the efficacy analysis. But these patients got no IV leading. If you came in with a drug use history and you were febrile and had a murmur and people suspected endocarditis, you were immediately put on oral therapy or IV therapy in a randomized manner. The oral regimen was odd. Most of us would not choose to use Cipro as a backbone for staph therapy, but at the time there were no advanced generation fluoroquinolones. Leva was not out yet when this trial was done, so they added rifampin to it. <clears throat> and what they found now, one of the complaints we'll come to in a moment is MRSA. There was a few cases of MRSA, it was mostly MSSA. What they found was no difference in clinical or microbiological cure, but there was a huge difference in side effects. Patients who got IV only therapy had a much higher rate of adverse events. Is this a perfect study? No, there's no such thing as a perfect study. Relatively small, that's not a huge number of patients, mostly younger patients, IVDA, mostly right sided endocarditis because of the IVDA history. Cipro, not the drug we would have chosen. I prefer 600 once a day over FAMP and 300 BID achieves much lower levels than 600 once a day. So the Cipro and the wrong rifampin dose would have disadvantaged the oral arm of anything. And then there's the big complaint people just love to harass me with. So I'm just going to get this out of the way for you all. MRSA. Yeah, there were five cases of MRSA. It was mostly MSSA. So people are like, well, we don't have any data for MRSA, so I can't do it for MRSA. This is a phantom menace. I'm tired of hearing about it, I'm tired of discussing it. Let's just get it out of the way. The concern that because only a few patients had MRSA means we can't use oral therapy for MRSA makes no sense whatsoever, and here's why. Does anybody disagree with this statement? Does anybody disagree that IV beta-lactam therapy for MSSA is at least as effective as IV vancomycin for MRSA? Because I've given this talk at least 45 times now, and no one has ever disagreed with this. So if you are, unmute yourself and shout it out or forever hold your peace. Because if you agree that IV beta-lactam therapy is at least as effective for MSSA as IV Banco is for MRSA, then what we have is the mathematical transitive principle. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. If I show you, or if I accept that IV therapy with beta-lactams is as good for MSSA as IV Vanco for MRSA, and I then show you that oral therapy is as effective as IV beta-lactam therapy for MSSA, then it must be at least as effective as IV Vanco for MRSA. Note we could not go the other direction. If the data had shown oral therapy was as effective as Vanco for MRSA, none of us would be comfortable saying, well, that means it's also as effective as beta-lactams for MSSA. But that's not the direction of the data. The data show oral was as effective as MSSA. It must be as effective as MRSA. I'm tired of hearing this. This is the last desperate complaint made by people who feel their argument slipping away that they might actually have to consider oral therapy for a patient every now and then. Before I show you the last randomized control trial, which is the largest, it is worth mentioning this quasi-experimental study, which may be important, but I'm going to be overt with you that there are some concerns. The concern about this study is Didier Rowe was the senior and corresponding author. For those of you unfamiliar, Didier Rowe was the person who published the case series first saying Plaquenil was an effective treatment for COVID. And since that time, his work has undergone serious scrutiny. His institution has released a statement indicating that he is being investigated for systematic ethical lapses in his conduct of research. Several of his papers, journals have released statements indicating that they are retracting. I will, however, point out 
The journal has not threatened to retract to this paper. I do not have any specific reason to be concerned about this specific paper, but you should factor all this information about Didier Rao into the, to this study, into your interpretation of the results of this study. What his colleagues did was in 2012, put into place a treatment protocol at their hospital in France where everyone with staph endocarditis, and this is entirely staph endocarditis, was treated with one week of IV lead-in followed by five weeks of oral Bactrim transitional therapy. These were mostly left-sided endocarditis, lots of prosthetic valves and cardiac devices, and there were MRSA patients in the cohort. They then went back and asked the question, they looked at 171 consecutive patients treated with the oral transitional therapy and compared them to 170 consecutive patients treated immediately prior to the switch from 2001 to 2011 and asked, was there a difference in outcome? What they described at final follow-up was a statistically significantly lower death rate in patients with the oral transitional therapy protocol. Now, remember this number, mortality rate of 19 with oral, 30 with IV, that difference is 11%. Remember that difference because it's gonna come up again in a minute. Let's talk about the POET study. The largest randomized control trial of oral versus IV therapy for endocarditis published in 2019. Mostly left-sided disease, lots of prosthetic valve and devices. In the original publication, the authors described six months of follow-up data. And at that time, there was no statistical difference in treatment failure or death, although the point estimates were lower, not statistically different, but were lower for oral than IV. The authors then published a three and a half year follow-up and more recently have published a five year follow-up of the same cohorts of patients that were randomized. And at last follow-up, the patients who were randomized to oral therapy had a statistically significantly lower death from oral than IV therapy. Look at the difference in magnitude. It's 11%, exactly the same as the quasi-experimental study from France described. So what we have for endocarditis, is we have 20 observational studies, a quasi-experimental study, and three randomized controlled trials. In all of those studies, oral was at least as effective as IV. There's not one that showed IV was better. In the two large case control studies, the large quasi-experimental study and the large RCT, oral therapy was superior on death to IV, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, right? Here are Here is your summary table of your randomized controlled trials the quasi-experimental study is in italics. Here's your weighted average without the quasi-experimental study, and here's with. It really doesn't change the conclusion much at all. <clears throat> here is your random effects forest plot meta-analysis with the quasi-experimental study included, statistically significantly better outcomes with oral therapy than IV. Not only is oral not worse, it looks better. Now, if you take the quasi-experimental study out, it doesn't change really the point estimate of the difference. It just skews the confidence interval, so you cross zero. So not statistically different, but geez, man, it sure still looks better. Are there any contrary data? The answer is, it doesn't matter what language you say the word in, and I've done this talk now in eight countries, and I always add their languages. No matter what language you say the word in, the answer comes back none. Being a space alien from another solar system myself, I've also given you some interstellar languages, and even in those languages, the answer is none. All of the available controlled studies, including 21 randomized controlled trials, show that oral therapy is safe and effective for osteomyelitis, bacteremia, and endocarditis. There are no published contrary controlled studies. Does this mean you can use any drug you want? No. Obviously, I wouldn't use sulfonilamide for endocarditis, right? You want to use a bioavailable agent that has published efficacy data. 
Some of you, and we are in the home stretch here, there's just a couple more slides. Some of you are thinking now, okay, actually, that's kind of cool. You know, maybe I could start doing this in patients who aren't very sick. I'm still going to do IV in the sicker patients because I have to because it's better. But if they're not very sick, no, if that's what you're thinking, you've missed the point. The point is not that oral therapy is fine for not sick patients, but not for sick patients. Oral is not less effective than IV. We've got to get past this anchor bias we have that IV has somehow been established to be better when it's not. We know oral is at least as effective and oral is safer. The script here is flipped. If skeptics want to continue insisting on IV only therapy, skeptics need to conduct a superiority study that shows that IV is better because all of the data to date say it's not. Finally, people ask me, are you really trying to suggest that oral therapy is more effective than IV for endocarditis? And the answer is no, I'm not suggesting that. Remember the question I started with? Is it reasonable to consider oral therapy for endocarditis? I'm not saying oral is more effective. I'm saying it's not less effective. There is a suggestion from the data that oral therapy actually may be more effective for endocarditis, but we would need a second large randomized control trial to confirm that. If it's better, why might it be? There are a variety of hypotheses out there. If you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves from the POET study, the, they began to diverge during treatment, but the magnitude of the difference continued to diverge for several years. Here's your multiple years out before they began to narrow back in. It almost looks like something happened during the first six weeks which set the patients up for longer term complications and harm. Perhaps getting people out of the hospital faster and getting the plastic out of their body faster prevents them from developing things like DVT, central venous stenosis, and other complications that will haunt them down the line. That's a hypothesis which merits testing in the future. Finally, to help our practitioners choose which patients are appropriate for oral therapy and which oral regimens to use, we've developed some expected practices. <clears throat> we have suggested that you can switch patients to oral therapy when all five of these criteria are met. All five. First, the patient is hemodynamically stable. Second, if you need to do a source control procedure, do it first. It makes no sense to take someone, make them put them on oral therapy and then make them an NPO for a procedure and then they stop taking their oral therapy. If you're gonna do a procedural source control, do it first. This also helps prevent you from sending home someone who needed source control. We have suggested not based on data, that if the patient was bacteremia, bacteremic, it's best to clear the bacteremia first before switching to oral, not based on data, but because a primary reason people have persistent bacteremia is source control has not been achieved. Please don't rush them home. Think about the source control, take care of that first, then switch to oral therapy. Third, there is a published regimen available, which has been used for the disease in question and covers the etiologic bacteria. Fourth, the gut is working. And fifth, there is no psychosocial reason to prefer IV. What do I mean by that? LA is now the homelessness capital of the United States or the unsheltered homelessness capital of the United States. My hospital is a mile and a half from Skid Row. 20% of our admissions are homeless. If I can create a skilled nursing need that will help procure housing for this patient from a holistic perspective, it actually may be better for that patient to stay on IV. So we're suggesting that the decision about oral versus IV should be part of a global question what is in the best interest of this patient holistically? We've given some tables to our providers so they know which drugs have been studied against which bugs at what doses in which public studies, uh, published studies. And we've given some text to help them further de delineate which drug they want to use for their patients. And with that, I will stop and open the floor up to questions. Dr. Spellberg, many thanks. Um, what an outstanding presentation, which is called out in uh, several of the comments here. Um, and I'll just launch into a few questions for you. Uh, first off, this is a great talk. Thank you. I wonder how you account for the stickiness of this dogmatic adherence to the superiority of IV antibiotics in the setting of these data. I have heard very little even suggested around the equivalence of oral versus IV in these settings. 
Am I uniquely ignorant? <laughs> no, you're in the sweet spot of the curve, my friend. Thank you for asking that question. Um, A, medicine is an inherently conservative profession. The central ethos of our profession is a 2,500-year-old oath that hasn't changed in those 2,500 years. There is literature on this point. Doctors tend to lock in their practice habits during the residency, and they rarely question those practice habits for many years thereafter. The literature suggests that it takes 15 to 20 years from the time a high quality study is published for doctors be to begin to routinely incorporate that evidence into their practice. This is a central failing of medical education. Once you learn something, we learn from these eminent giants that we look up to. We never go back and ask, what was that based on? And so you're exactly right. Um, this, this is the central thing that I've been fighting for some years. I will say with hope. I started using oral therapy for osteomyelitis around 2007-ish. And at the time, my colleagues told me I was committing malpractice. And I said, well, I have data and you don't, so I'm going to keep doing it. Um, it's been 15 years. It is starting to become mainstream for osteo. Starting to be, you start going to, to lectures, you start going to national meetings, you are now starting to hear platform lectures where people, oh yeah, for osteo, oral's okay. Just beginning. Endocarditis is still 10 to 15 years behind, and I expect 15 years from now, people will accept it, but it's gonna take that period of time to be, have it become mainstream. Thank you for the response. Um, next question. A common heuristic in medicine is that IV antibiotics provide more reliable tissue concentration than oral, but this seems to cast substantial doubt uh, on this assumption. Are there any circumstances of these conditions discussed today where you would still default to IV? Uh, I think some of this was spelled out in the criteria outlined at the end of your talk, but specific comments on when you would really favor IV. Yeah, so we, we, we should be clear, there is some truth to the first part of the statement. What you have more of with oral is variability. When you administer it IV, you know it's all going intravenous, right? When you administer orally, patients will have some variability in the degree to which they absorb the drug. So what we want to do is use a drug oral that is known despite variability to reliably achieve levels at the target site of infection. We do have oral regimens in the modern era that can do that. That doesn't mean that they'll achieve the same peak level in bone uh, or blood, but the point is that they will achieve adequate levels in bone or blood to reliably cure infections. So that's why you want to use a published regimen with a bioavailable agent and not just any regimen off the shelf. Um, to the second part of your question, I really do use those five criteria. If the patient is unstable, I ain't giving them oral therapy. What if blood flow to the gut is diminished and they're not gonna absorb? They're not going home when they're unstable anyway, why am I rushing them onto oral? If they need procedural source control, if they have persistent bacteremia that's not clearing, I'm not switching them to oral. If their gut is not working, obviously I'm not switching them to oral. If they have an organism that I have no good oral option for, I'm not switching them to oral. And if I can justify a sniff stay for someone who has no place to go other than back to the street, to their tent, and I can use that IV therapy as a way to get them housing for six weeks so they get back on their feet, that's a win for that patient. I'm gonna use IV. Those are my criteria. Perfect, thank you. Um, do you recommend use of drug level measurement in any circumstances when picking a drug for a particular bug, particularly when dealing with prosthetic device related infections or relatively resistant organisms? That's a great question. And my answer is no, but not, but for, for a dissatisfying reason, because I can't get them. And when I send them out, they take weeks to come back. So they're not helpful to me. If I could get them in real time, it wouldn't be a bad idea. And so that may vary from place to place. I think the way I deal with that um, is if I'm worried, I'd use a POET regimen. In POET, they used two drugs instead of one. And they were very clear. 
They used two drugs in Poet, not because two drugs were known to be better than one, but they felt that using two drugs would make it more likely to have at least one of them be therapeutic in levels. So if I'm worried about a case like that, I would use a Poet regimen with two drugs. Uh, thank you, very helpful response. Um, very specific question here. We'll see if you have uh, insight. What will the future of PO be given that Dalbavancin has been used more frequently in the described pathologies? Yeah, that I, that that is a good question. Um, I suspect Dalbavancin will increasingly play a role in these diseases, and I have no problem with that. I'm just not willing to pay five thousand dollars for it. If I can spend 40 bucks on Bactrim instead of 5,000 bucks on Dalbavancin, I'm going to use the $40 worth of, of Bactrim. But as Dalva's price drops in the future, as it becomes generic, I think it's perfectly reasonable that it become incorporated into the treatment paradigms for these diseases. Thank you. We have about five minutes to go and the questions keep flowing in, so we'll, we'll continue forward. Um, I suspect you are asked to give expert testimony in cases where a bad outcome has occurred in a case where oral therapy was chosen. Of course, we know bad outcomes occur independent of whether oral or IV was chosen. Can you comment on whether the data you have discussed today is persuasive to juries when another expert is touting anecdotal experience? Um, and perhaps just in case reviews if this has not been done in the legal setting. Dr. Dworkin is, as usual, ahead of the curve. Not enough people have been using oral therapy for there to have been a med mal case where someone approached me to ask me for my opinion on it. So actually, that hasn't happened yet, Ron. Um, but to your point, if I was asked, I would come in guns blazing. And I would present the data, and the other person would present because I said so, and you tell me which a jury's going to find more compelling. Because I'll tell you this, one thing juries probably don't like is the sense that God, doctors think they're God and know everything. And that's actually part of the point here. This is about humility, believe it or not. It's the humility to admit when we don't know something, as opposed to guidelines and the people who write them saying, you have to do this because we said so, even though there's not data for it, which is not a humble thing to do. There's a question I see about the I, I am board exam. Don't give oral on your I am board exam, okay? I think for osteo, they may start in the board exams saying that's a reasonable option. The medical establishment is still very much for endocarditis in the IV side. It's sad, really. So. I'm talking about practicing medicine. If you're taking your boards, get the question right so you've passed your boards. Eventually, it'll make its way into the boards. Great, many thanks for helping us pass our boards, also important. Um, any specific concern or insights regarding drug-drug interactions with linazolid specifically, and also keeping in mind that there may be recreational drug interactions? Yeah. I actually have had very little drug interaction problems with linezolid. Yes, SSRIs are a concern, although I think the concern is overstated, at least in terms of the frequency of the problem. Um, the big issue with linezolid is you go past two weeks, you need to monitor CBC. You go past four weeks, you need to worry about irreversible neurotox. So I rarely go past four weeks of linezolid. I don't actually mind reversible hematotox. I can just CBC and transfuse if I have to. It's not a big deal but I don't like the irreversible neuro, and that doesn't happen in the first four weeks. So the point is this, this is why in our expected practices, we gave multiple options based on published data. If linezolid isn't right for this person because of an SSRI or another drug interaction, is there another combination regimen or another regimen that could be used for that target pathogen? Great, many thanks. I uh, recognize we're getting near the end of our time. There was an earlier question regarding duration of oral therapy. Um, which clearly may depend on the circumstance, but any specific comments on duration? Yeah, duration is a great question. So has nothing to do with oral or IV. The answer is the same. The duration doesn't change oral versus IV. We know for osteomyelitis, and that's a separate talk, the shorter is better talk, uh, that from two randomized controlled trials, six is as effective as 12. 
So we don't need to go beyond six weeks for osteo. Do we need six weeks? There are some smaller randomized control trials that really need to be repeated that suggest three to four weeks may be adequate. So we don't yet know how short you can go, but we know you don't have to go longer than six weeks. For endocarditis, and frankly, for non-gram negative bacteremia, for gram positive bacteremia, it's no one knows. We do six weeks because the staff mafia tells us to do six weeks, and we're all afraid of the staff mafia because they'll put a hit out on us. There are some angry people in this country that study staff. Let me just tell you that right now. So we do six weeks because they tell us we have to and we're afraid of them, but we really need trials to actually answer that question. Well, and on that note, uh, I'll respect that we're at the top of the hour. Just an outstanding talk and many excellent questions. Um, thank you for the insights and um, shifting our practice. Right, thank you, Dr. Spalberg.